How's it going guys? White Rabbit here. Today I wanted to address the claims that the uh, Flat Earthers like to make, which is that the Bible, according to them, teaches that the Earth is flat. Now, aside from the fact that the Bible does not teach that the Earth is flat, my biggest problem with this is that they're convincing Christians that the Bible does teach that the Earth is flat, and in turn, that if they don't believe the Earth is flat, then they don't believe the Bible, and thus they're not really a Christian. This is essentially extortion, and it's totally unscriptural. It's, I would consider it blasphemy. And look, the, the bottom line is, if you believe the gospel, you're a Christian, okay? Nowhere in there does it say, you have to believe the earth is flat. That's ridiculous. I'll take it one step further. I even believe that if you happen to believe in evolution, you can still be a Christian. So trying to push this whole narrative that you have to interpret the Bible a certain way or you're not a Christian is demeaning to the faith, and it's an insult to Christianity as a whole, and therein lies the problem. What they are trying to do is demean Christianity, okay? This isn't just a psyop on truthers. It's also a psyop on Christianity, and you guys got to realize that. So what I'm going to do here real quick is I'm going to go through some of the more common Bible verses that they love to point out, and I'm going to explain to you why each individual verse is not teaching a flat earth. And I guess really the first point that I should start off with here is why does the Bible use terminology that is associated with flat earth theology as seen in Babylonian mythology to explain biblical concepts? And the answer is quite simple, because that's what the society of the time was familiar with. you got to remember, the Bible was written for us. It was not written to us. So when you're putting things in context, you don't only put things in context with the actual Bible, but you put things in context with the historical associations of that time frame. And if you do that, not only will all this start to make sense, but you'll get a much deeper understanding of Scripture. So when we're talking about scripture using mythological constructs like from Babylonian mythology or Egyptian mythology, we can look at the ancient deity known as Baal. Now let me give you a quick rundown of Baal here. Baal was a god worshipped in many ancient Middle Eastern communities, especially among the Canaanites, who apparently considered him as a fertility deity and one of the most important gods in the Pantheon. As a Semitic common noun, Baal meant owner or lord, although it could be used more generally. For example, a bale of wings was a winged creature, and in the plural, balem of arrows indicated archers. Yet such fluidity in the use of the term bale did not prevent it from being attached to a god of distinct character. As such, bale designated the universal god of fertility, and in that capacity was titled the prince, lord of the earth. Now, does that sound familiar to you, right? The prince of the earth? Lucifer, Satan? Okay. He's also called the Lord of Rain and Dew, the two forms of moisture that were indispensable for fertile soil and canon. Okay, so there's also a lot of symbology with him and water and, and moisture and fertility and things like that. You also have to remember that in ancient Egyptian mythology, that kind of goes hand in hand with their depiction of creation, which I'm not going to get into in this video. You can look that up on your own. But the main point being that this was basically who they considered to be God, was this Baal figure. And as we know, Baal is really just Lucifer. Now the other thing I want you to understand is that in ancient mythology, Baal was seen as the storm god, and he was known as he who rides the clouds. He was also called Baal Shamen, Lord of the Heavens. Okay, so that kind of gives you a background of Baal in ancient literature. Now if you open your Bibles to Isaiah 19.1, you might find this interesting, where the scripture says, The burden of Egypt. Behold, the Lord rideth upon the swift cloud, and shall come into Egypt. And the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence, and the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. So right there we have, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud. But in ancient times, the God associated with riding on a cloud was Baal. So why would scripture say that the God of the Bible was doing the same thing? And if you break down into the Hebrew, the word translated to Lord, or to the Lord in English, 
comes from the Hebraic word Yahweh. So it is specifying the Hebrew God, not Baal. What the scripture is doing in this passage, and again, if you look at the actual context of, of the verse itself, it's slapping Egyptian mythology in the face. It's essentially saying, the God you've been worshiping, yeah, that's not the real God. Yahweh is the real God, and you're going to know it. That's what this passage is saying. But I wanted to just throw that one out there. And there are a lot of examples in Scripture from God writing upon the cloud. And the reason it's used is because it was something that was familiar to ancient peoples. And it's something that they would immediately realize, you know, what was being said there. This is also, coincidentally, by the way, where you get a lot of, you know, Gnostic teachings or Luciferian teachings who are trying to convince you that the God of the Bible is Baal, which is ridiculous. But that's kind of, you know, you got to understand where people come up with this logic. And you also have to understand why the Bible explains things the way that it does and why it words things the way that it does. It's a literary articulation that expresses theological constructs. So keep that in the back of your mind while you also consider the fact that writing back in ancient times was not the same thing as writing in the 21st century. Writing back then took a much longer time. It was all done by hand. It was written on specially handmade pieces of parchment or lambskin or whatever. And it was much more of a specialty. So when the scribes would write things, they would also interject poetic phrases. And they would word things in a poetic way because it was viewed more as an art form as opposed to just jotting something down. Now, I believe every word of the Bible. And I want to make that perfectly clear. I believe the Bible is completely true. And I do believe that it is to be taken literally, but not to such a degree that you take it out of context. For example, did the sons of God marry the daughters of men? Yes, that literally happened. But in the parable of the prodigal son, did that really happen? Not necessarily. That was a story. That was a parable. And parables are not only present in the New Testament. This is a theological book, first and foremost. And I want you to remember that as we start diving into some of these verses. Now, one of the most common verses that flat earthers point to in order to stake their argument is found in Isaiah 40, verse 22, where it says, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretches out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Okay, now they argue that the word circle there is essentially somehow meaning that the earth is flat. There are... A ton of problems with that. But before we get into that, let's look at the context, okay? Let's look at a few verses before that and a couple verses after. We'll start in verse oh, 18. To whom then will ye liken God? And what likeness will ye compare unto him? The workman melteth a graven image, and the goldsmith spreadeth it over with gold, and casteth silver chains. He that is so impoverished that he hath no oblation, chooseth a tree that will not rot. He that seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. Have ye not known? Have ye not heard? Hath it not been told to you from the beginning? Have ye not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in, that bringeth the princes to nothing. He maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. Ye they shall not be planted, ye they shall not be shown. Ye their stock shall not take root in the earth. And he shall also bow upon them, and they shall wither, and the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. To whom then will ye liken me? Or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? So again, ladies and gentlemen, what is being said here? He's talking about graven images. He's talking about worshiping uh, other gods or false gods and, and making idols to them. And then it's basically saying that they're wrong. The one true God is Yahweh. And it talks about the mightiness of God. So explain to me, what does the sitteth upon the circle of the earth have to do with the shape of the earth? Nothing. It's not even talking about the shape of the earth. It's talking about the mightiness of God. The majesty of God. What do I mean by that? Well, a circle, first off, is a two-dimensional shape. We live in a three-dimensional realm, if you will. So a circle, by definition, is a construct. It's not even a real shape. 
So why are they saying that he sitteth upon the circle of the earth? Well, he sitteth, okay? That is his throne. That is his dominion, his authority. And it says circle of the earth because a circle has no beginning and no end. It is infinite. It is perfect. It's everlasting. It's whole. It's complete. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the association being made here. They're saying that God is eternal. He has no beginning and no end. He is that is. That is what's being said. And then it goes on to say the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. Meaning, nothing else compares to God. Now, aside from the fact that I don't know how you can get circle to mean flat earth, also consider that the Hebraic word translated to circle there, which is kahug, or however you pronounce it, can also mean vault or horizon, or circuit, or compass. And the argument that people use is frequently that this word can also be translated as vault, to which the flat earthers then rebuttal with, the Hebraic language already had a word for sphere, and if God meant to say sphere in that passage, he would have said sphere. But what I'm trying to point out to you is that this has a deeper meaning than just shape. That is why this particular Hebraic word was used because the literal shape took secondary precedence to the overall narrative of that passage. Moving on. Another verse that they love pointing out is Job 37, verse 18, which says, Hast thou him spread out the sky, which is strong, and as a molten looking glass. Now they argue that what the scripture is saying right here is that the sky is literally molten glass. Now, also keep in mind that this can be translated as molten mirror, but that's just kind of a secondary thing. Um, let's look at the facts. This verse was first off translated as, and as a molten looking glass. It is not saying that the sky is a molten looking glass. Now, in order to get the context, the full context of Job 37, you really need to back up into Job 36, where it's talking about thunderstorms and so on. Then when you get to Job 37, again, it's talking about God's majesty, but it's, it's talking in relation to the storm and the thunderstorms that was discussed in the previous chapter. And it's saying, you know, that the same God who makes the thunderstorm also makes the sunny day, right? He, the rain that God pours out on the earth is what feeds the land and what replenishes the earth. And it goes through, and it, he, he's talking about, like in, in verse 13, it says, he causeth it to come, whether for correction, or for his land, or for mercy. Hearken unto this, O Job, stand still, and consider the wondrous works of God. That's the context, okay? So then why is basically the sky compared to a molten looking glass, okay? Well, you gotta understand, again, that can be translated as mirror, and looking glass is an old terminology for a mirror, so it's really the same thing. But mirrors in ancient times, again, you have to have the ancient perspective on this. Mirrors in ancient times were made of metal and the power of their reflection was dependent on them being highly burnished. So let me expand on this with a little bit of a commentary I found, where it says, Such a mirror might stand as an image of brightness as well as of strength or stability. The dazzling effluence of an eastern sky, too great for the eye to bear, may have really been the point of comparison here. The apostle alludes to the comparatively imperfect reflection of mirrors made of metal, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. But the divine mirror, notwithstanding all the storms which pass over it, is as bright now as in the morn of creation. The speaking of the strength of the sky, there is no evidence that this author regarded it as solid. So, you know, I guess really the moral of the story here is you got to take it in context and you got to understand what is really being described, okay? It's a comparison to something that was familiar to ancient peoples in the context of the chapter. You know, scripture picking various different verses out of the Bible, completely removing them from the context in which they sit, only to further push some preconceived notion is not how you interpret scripture. Okay, now let's jump to another one in Job 9, verse 6. This is another one they love pointing to, where it says, Which shaketh the earth out of her place, and the pillars thereof tremble. Now they argue that this must be meaning that the earth is literally sitting on pillars. 
However, again, when taken in context, the earth is represented as sustained like a building by pillars or columns. It's merely poetic representation. Yes, it also harkens to Babylonian mythology, as we discussed previously. But is this to be taken literally, as Flat Earthers would suggest? No, and I'll tell you why. Because this is from Job. And if you fast forward to Job 26 verse 7, it says, He stretches out the north over an empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. So if you want to take a literal position on this verse, then you have to conclude that Job and thus the Bible itself is contradicting itself. Okay, now let's jump to another one. They love to point to 1 Chronicles 16.30. And this passage says, Fear before him all the earth, the world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. But then the following verse, which they never bring up, of course, in verse 31 says, Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice, and let men say among the nations, The Lord reigneth. Okay, this is David's psalm of thanksgiving. That's the context. But this word for stable, when it's talking about the earth being stable and be not moved, that is hearkening back to Psalm 96. And in Psalm 96, it says, Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Again, yeah, you are getting a little bit of that Babylonian mythological representation in that passage. But in the context of the passage, that's not what it's saying. It is not saying that the earth is literally still. And that may be surprising to some of you because I've covered the geocentric position on my main channel. But let's set that aside for now, okay? Let's, let's go into this without preconceived notions of any kind, okay? What it's saying is, you converted Gentiles declare to those who yet remain in the darkness of heathenism that the Lord reigneth, that God hath now fixed his throne and set up his kingdom in the world, and the world shall also be established, and as that kingdom shall never be destroyed and shall stand forever, so the nations of the world shall, by the means of it, enjoy an established and lasting peace. What this is saying is that under the reign of God, the meaning is that the world is fixed or immovable. It has its place, and it cannot be moved out of it. The government of God is fixed and stable. It's not temporary or changing like the dynasties on earth, but is steadfast and abiding and is well represented by the earth so fixed and firm that nothing can move it from its place. Now also realize that this is a comparative analogy in relative terms. Is this saying that the earth does not spin? No. Is it saying that the earth does spin? No. It has nothing to do with that. It's talking about relative to a human being, okay? The earth is not moving under your feet relative to you, whether it is in fact spinning or not. It has nothing to do with that. It's like saying you're not going to move a mountain, right? You would describe a mountain as being in one place and being immovable, wouldn't you? You wouldn't say, hey, that mountain is moving around the sun and spinning at so many thousand miles an hour. You wouldn't say that. So this is a relative comparison, describing the steadfast nature of God's kingdom. Okay, now another one that they love to point to is in Revelation 20 or in Revelation 7 when it's talking about the four corners of the earth. Now, Revelation 20 says, He will go out and deceive Gog and Magog, the nations at the four corners of the earth, and gather them for war. They are as numerous as the sands of the seashore. Okay, now they want to make you believe that the four corners of the earth is saying that the earth is flat. First off, the vast majority of flat earthers think that the earth, even if it was flat, is round. So I don't understand why you would even use that for your argument to begin with. Second off, this actual Hebraic word is translated as borders in Numbers 1538 and in Ezekiel 7.2. Yes, it's translated as four corners in Isaiah 11.12, and Job 37.3, and 38.13, but in Greek, its relative word in Greek is gonia, and the Greek meaning is perhaps more closely related to the modern divisions known as quadrants. Gonia literally means angles or divisions. It is customary to divide a map into quadrants as shown by the four directions. Okay, so basically, it's talking about north, south, east, and west. The northern quadrant, the southern quadrant, 
the western quadrant, and the eastern quadrant. Okay? That's what it's talking about. It's not talking about four literal corners. Okay, so, guys, that's pretty much the gist of it. And you can apply the same logic when taken in context with pretty much all of the passages that Flat Earthers love to point to. I've given you basically the blueprint to understand this stuff. And the blueprint, da-da-da-da, is context. Yes, you put the Bible in context. You don't pick and choose verses and pick and choose translations that fit your preconceived notions. That's not how you do it. <sighs> now, I think I've made my point. And again, the reason I wanted to go over this is because as people are beginning to wake up to the psyop that is this flat earth nonsense, I don't want them turning around and losing faith in scripture. The scriptures are true. Plain and simple. They are true. Do not lose sight of that. And don't attribute being deceived by an individual into misinterpreting scripture as the scripture itself being invalid. Now, if you guys thought that this was helpful and you appreciated me doing this, please let me know in the comments down below and give this video a big thumbs up. If you guys really, really want me to, I guess I can go through every single verse that they point out, but it's going to be a lot of repetition. Um, but let me know if that's what you want. Personally, I, again, you know, I think I've made my point. I'd like to move on to bigger and better things, but at the same time, you know, I don't want to see people who were Christians waking up to this flat earth deception and in turn turning their back on scripture. I don't want to see that. But for now, you know, I've done what I felt was necessary. Those seeking truth will have listened to this entire video and those who don't won't. So, you know, it is what it is. Thanks for listening, everybody. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe. Thanks and God bless.